The 19th century was a time of revolution for Europe, which saw not only the rise of industry in the nation state as we know it today, but also the beginnings of modern social science. All aspects of life were being reevaluated in the wake of the Enlightenment, and in particular, scholars were turning a critical eye towards religion. In countries like Germany, biblical criticism was in full flower, and academic fields like Indo-European studies and comparative religion were just getting started. Religions from the East, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, were beginning to receive serious study in Europe, and scholars soon began noticing similarities between the philosophies of the East and West. Though the idea of an ancient theology goes back to the Renaissance, philosophical movements such as the Transcendentalists began to arise during the Enlightenment that championed Universalist and Unitarian ideas, which is the idea that truth and God were one. When very similar ideas were found in the East, with famous examples such as the saying that truth is one, sages call it by various names, found in the Rig Veda, people began to seriously consider the idea that all the world's religions and philosophies came from a singular core truth. This came to be called perennial philosophy, with the idea being that like a perennial plant, which does not die in winter but comes back to life year after year. There is a single truth which has come back time and time again to inspire all the great systems of thought in the world. One of the most popular communicators of this philosophy was Aldous Huxley, who described it as such. The perennial philosophy is expressed most succinctly in the Sanskrit formula, tat tuam asi, that thou art. The Atman, or immanent eternal self, is one with Brahman, the absolute principle of all existence and the last end of every human being is to discover the fact for himself, to find out who he really is. Perennial philosophy is the metaphysic that recognizes a divine reality substantial to the world of things and lives and minds. The psychology that finds in the soul something similar to, or even identical to, divine reality. The ethic that places man's final end in the knowledge of the imminent and transcendent ground of all being. The thing is immemorial and universal. Rudiments of the perennial philosophy may be found among the traditional lore of primitive peoples in every region of the world, and in its fully developed forms, it has a place in every one of the higher religions. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're not talking about perennial philosophy as much as I'd love to. No, we're talking about the pre-Socratic philosopher who would end up having a huge influence in how philosophy itself would develop in the first place, Parmenides. His view that all reality is an eternal unity, with change being an illusion, would have a major impact on the philosophy of Plato and later Neoplatonism, which would declare that all of reality was an emanation of the One. Though early Christians such as Origen, Gregory of Nicaea, and most importantly Saint Augustine would reject certain views of the philosophers, Neoplatonism was a huge influence on early Christian theology. In fact, it was the arguments of the Neoplatonist philosophers in Milan that would end up convincing Augustine to convert from being a Manichaean to Christianity. The rivalry between the philosophy of Parmenides and that of Heraclitus would go on to define Western philosophy and has been compared to the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism in Eastern philosophy. There's a lot to unpack here. We're really getting into some foundational stuff for Western philosophy, and we're definitely not going to be able to cover everything today. So if you want to learn more about ancient Greece and the beginnings of Western philosophy, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. We got new content coming out every week. Anyways, let's get into it. Philosophy was forever changed after Parmenides. Scholar Robin Waterfield puts it best. After Parmenides, pre-Socratic thought could not remain the same, since subsequent thinkers felt they had to respond to the challenge he offered to all scientific thought. And the resolution of certain logical difficulties he raised sharpened the thought of both Plato and Aristotle. And all this from a man who wrote poetry of a Homeric kind and saw himself, as the prologue of his poem clearly shows, as much a shaman or a mystic as philosopher, making a spiritual and philosophical journey just as Homer's Odysseus had traveled the known world. If the philosophy of Parmenides were summed up into a single sentence, it would be that whatever is, is, and what is not, cannot be. King Lear's famous line, nothing will come from nothing, is in fact an ancient phrase that is also credited to Parmenides. Philosopher A.C. Grayling tells us that the key point for Parmenides is that one cannot think about what is not, whereas anything that can be thought must be. It is the same thing that can be thought and that can be. It needs must be that what can be spoken and thought is. For it is possible for it to be, and it is not possible for what is nothing to be. Another way of putting this is to say, if you think, 
you must be something, therefore, there cannot be nothing. Only that can exist which can be thought. Thought exists for the sake of what is. The truth is that what is must be a single, unchanging, and complete thing, perfect, whole, and eternal. The views of other philosophers premised on the transformation of an archy into a plurality of things based on motion and change, on interaction, flux, reparation, mingling, or whatever the thinkers in question have suggested, are false in the light of reason, for only an eternal, immutable, and comprehensive one is thinkable. Though it is doubtful that Parmenides actually knew Xenophanes, he is the most obvious influence on his thought, and if we compare the two philosophers, we'll see why it was said in antiquity that Parmenides was a pupil of Xenophanes. Both argued against the popular conception of reality and the gods, in favor of a monistic, pantheistic god. That is, God is the universe itself, and the universe is one. The only surviving work of Parmenides is his poem, On Nature, which is split into two parts, the way of truth and the way of opinion. As Robin Waterfield said earlier, it's just as much a mystical journey as it is a philosophical one. He is escorted by the daughters of the sun to a mythical place, the abode of a goddess where all opposites in the universe, including even night and day, meet, a place where everything is undivided and one. The goddess welcomes him, saying, Welcome, youth, who come attended by immortal charioteers and mares which bear you on your journey to our dwelling. For it is no evil fate that has set you to travel on this road, far from the beaten paths of men, but right and justice. It is meet that you learn all things, both the unshakable heart of well-rounded truth and the opinions of mortals in which there is not true belief. Though not much remains of the significantly longer second section, The Way of Opinion, we do know that in it he essentially represents the cosmological views that were being set out by all the other popular and prominent philosophers that came before him. He discusses the archi, the causal reality that is understood through reason or logos, and all the other things we already covered in the videos on the Milesians and Heraclitus. You should check those out if you haven't. Link in the description. The point that he's really trying to make is though this may be how the world appears to us, it is not reality or truth itself. And while he definitely disagrees with Heraclitus the most, he still follows his lead by criticizing the thought of the other philosophers who came before him. The way of truth is that nature, reality, the universe, everything is one. It is all one to me where I begin, for I shall come back again there. He didn't believe in a beginning or end for the universe. Instead, he put forward the question, how could what is perish? How could it have come to be? For if it came into being, it is not, nor is it if ever it is going to be. Thus, coming into being is extinguished and destruction unknown. What exists is now all at once, one and continuous. Nor is it divisible, since it is all alike, nor is there any more or less of it in one place which might prevent it from holding together, but all is full of what is. This simple idea, monism, that all of reality, including us, is one, or comes from one source, would be the most important part of Parmenides' legacy. As philosopher A.C. Grayling says, Parmenides' greatest influence from the point of view of impact on the entire subsequent history of philosophy was on Plato and the Platonists. Plato admired Parmenides greatly. He has him worsting Socrates in a late dialogue, and he derives from him the view that the senses and what they tell us about the world of appearances, the familiar world around us, which seems plural and subject to time and change, deceive us as to the true nature of reality. That is a theme which has underwritten an enormous amount of what philosophy and later science has achieved. As we've seen, Though the beginnings of philosophy came from seeing rational cause and effect in the world instead of divine intervention, philosophy still had a very mystical flavor to it. Even though the Greeks were supremely confident in the rational powers of man, they hadn't intellectualized life to the point that they had lost their irrational passions and love for the transcendent. So in the next video, we're going to explore how the Greeks appeased the gods and sought their favor through sacrifice and magic. That's coming up next week. I hope you're excited, and I'll see you then.